Awesome. Thank you for coming. So, oh, real quick, this is the how, do, how does the web work? So if that's the one you're looking for, you're in the right one. If that's not the one you're looking for, you're in the wrong one. So <laughs> before we jump into it, real quick, uh, a little about me. That's me and my daughter. I am the developer of a product called WP Health, which is a monitor for WordPress sites. I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Florida. I co-organize WordCamp in Jacksonville, Florida. And you can find me pretty much anywhere at FB Corso, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever you want to find me on, it's all the same name. So real quick, before we dive into the actual content, this presentation is going to be a little technical, and then it would also oversimplify. But the goal of this entire presentation is for you to understand this process. So I'm going to go on some tangents and some facts and things that you don't have to remember every single part of. But when you walk away, the goal is to understand this process. So this is the process when someone enters your URL or your domain name into a browser. What happens for them to see your website? That's the goal of this presentation, is to learn how that process works. So this could be, you could call it page load process, I'm going to call it the cycle. But the goal is understanding this, so if I say some acronym or some term and I explain it and you, if you, don't, you won't remember it in six months, that's okay. The goal is this cycle. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to break it apart into two different sections. First, we're going to do a little bit of history to help us understand how we got here and why things are, are the way they are. And then we'll get into actually breaking down each of these steps. So let's talk a little bit about history. So the internet dates all the way back to the 1960s. So way back when, there was all these computers starting to come around. People were doing these cool things and these cool punch cards. And they wanted a way to access different computers remotely to help when they had a sort of math equation, things along those lines. They wanted to distribute some of these processing across multiple computers. And at the time, there was all these various scientists working at the MIT, ARPA, which later became DARPA, all these other places, sort of working on this theory called packet switching. So this concept breaks down to essentially whenever you send something across the internet, whether it's someone trying to get the HTML from your website or an image or even a video, the internet, this process of packet switching, breaks that up into tiny packets that they send across the cables that are connecting the computers. And this theory became packet switching and still continues to be the basis of the entire internet today. If you don't remember that term, that's okay. Remember the cycle is the, the thing that's get out of this. So these scientists all came together and started working for ARPA, which later became DARPA. And ARPA was like, hey, this is a really cool resource. It'd be amazing if we can start putting some of our computers together across the country, or even just across the office, or across even just the city to start connecting different things together so we can communicate across distance and send files back and forth and send data. And so they began researching something called the ARPANET. At the same time, IBM was working on various computers and technologies, and they realized they needed a way to display different types of information. And so they pondered, they put all their scientists on this, and they came up with something called the GML, which is a generalized markup language. If you look on the far right there, so that's up, over here, you'll see that there's all this tags. And this was a system of tags and attributes. Now, if you're not familiar with HTML, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but you'll see that this is going to look almost identical to how the web is structured today, and it was started by IBM back in the 60s. Now, just a random fun fact for you. The very first message on the ARPANET was sent in 1969. It was a person in UCLA. He went to send the message login. So he typed down L-O-G-I-N, hit send, and the receiver only received L-O because the system crashed halfway through the transmission. <laughs> so they had to reboot it, and then eventually it send the first mention. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to the 1970s. So in the 1970s, they started realizing, hey, all these people are working on this various technology at the same time. We're coming up with all these different ways to communicate. And they, they forecasted you know, a couple decades in the future and realized that every country and every team is all working on different ways to communicate. Nothing's going to work. We need to standardize how everything communicates. And so they started working on the concept of protocols and how computers will follow these protocols to communicate in the same way across computers, across networks, across countries. And one of the very first ones they came up with is something called the FTP, the File Transfer Protocol. And this protocol is still used today. You might come across this, or a developer you're speaking with might ask for FTP credentials. And this is the process of sending files from computer to computer. And it's this process, this protocol, was founded in the 1970s as one of the first protocols used in the computer age. Now, that, followed, that was closely followed by something, the precursor to SMTP, which I'll get to in just a moment, the mailbox protocol, which was how emails were originally sent on top of the FTP protocol. 
Now, fast forward a few years, eventually they came up with the SMTP, or the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. And this is still used today, how most of our emails are sent is over this protocol. So if we fast forward a little bit, ARPANET now is used on almost several different locations across the country. It exceeds over 3 million packets per day being sent. So it's a lot of data. That sounds like a lot, but that's less than a second in today's world. But that's a lot of data being sent already, considering they just started researching this a few years prior. So continuing their protocol research, they realized, hey, there's, we're starting to have all these other networks starting to form. So ARPANET was around, and then a couple colleges were like, hey, that's a really cool idea. We want to use the same packet switching theory. So we're going to start having our mini network. And then another country was starting to form their own network. And everyone was like, wait, we need a way to communicate across these different networks. Make sure everyone's still communicating. We're doing research and protocols. It would be a really nice way to have some sort of system so everyone can communicate across these networks. So this gentleman, Vint Cerf, and his friend Robert Kahn, they came up with something called the TCP IP protocol. Now, this process, uh, you don't have to remember exactly what these things were, but essentially you have an IP address for every, every connected device. So you have your internet protocol address. And the transmission control protocol is the exact process of how these communi computers are communicating. So your phone, your um, Nest AC unit, your remote control, microwave, and your smart um, tea kettle, all these different appliances are all connecting using this protocol TCP and IP, which was created in the 1970s. Now at the time, how they explained how this protocol worked was you have two different networks, and this protocol, TCP IP, will allow you to internet across the networks. So this was the concept of interneting, which is how our internet came to be, and this was considered the foundation and the beginning of the real internet. So we're going to fast forward just a little bit, and then we'll get to the actual cycle here. So we, were, we had all these different networks, all these computers coming out. We now can communicate across all these networks, and they realized, hey, now we have hundreds of IP addresses, and everyone's having to remember all these numbers. And if we go you know, another decade or two, we're going to have millions of IP addresses that everyone will have to remember if they want to access data. We need an easier way to do this. And so a lot of scientists came together, they were thinking over it, and they said, what we need is, you know, if we need to go to the local you know, shop or the local haircutter place or anything along those lines, we look to the phone book and maybe find the phone number to call them. So maybe we need a similar system for the browsers to use. Maybe we need the yellow book of the web or the yellow pages. And this is where the DNS domain name system came into play. So the domain name system allows someone to register a domain name. If you're here, you might already have a domain name like um, frankwisto.com or anything along those lines. And then if you type that in, you would get someone's website. Well, this is all handled in the background by the DNS, which we'll go over in more detail in just a moment. But this system allows the browser to go, hey, tell me what you're looking for, and then I will use the yellow pages to hunt it down and show you the correct content. So now that we have a DNS in place and computers are communicating, we started seeing some of the early browsers. Now these aren't the web browsers, for a distinction I'll get to in just a moment, but the very early browsers of being able to log into another computer and start seeing some data. So one of the very first ones was something called uh, PC Hypertext and then Silversmith. And these two used a descendant of the GML language. So IBM created the GML language. So some of these browsers used the SGML language, which was the standardized generalized markup language. And so this, these browsers, you would connect to computers, someone would have some content formatted in some this SGML language, and then you would see some content with some colors in it, you'd see some various images, things along those lines. And this was back in the 1980s. So as these different protocols started coming up, uh, this one was connecting over FTP. Some of them, you might have heard of something called Gopher. That was another competing protocol at the time. So there are different ways of actually connecting to some of this data to be seen in, a, in this handy format. And they were like, again, we need to have a standardized way of doing this. So this is where Sir Tim Berners-Lee proposed the HTML and HTTP system. So this is, the HTML is hypertext markup language, which is a descendant of the HTML, which is the descendant of GML. So if you look at this image here on the right, if you recall the previous image, these are going to look almost the same. So HTML, even what we use today, if you go to write any HTML or you've seen any HTML, it all traces back to the original GML in the 1960s. So he proposed we need some sort of markup language so everyone is creating and structuring their content the same way. And to handle this, we're going to create a new protocol called HTTP, or the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And so he proposed this, and this became the start of the web. So the internet 
is built on TCP, IP, connects your smart kettle, your phone, all these different devices. Actual website content that you're displaying, that is the web. And this is Sim, Sir Tim Berners-Lee is the one that founded that. Use it when he proposed the HTTP protocol. So we're going to fast forward a little bit to the 1990s. And we're going to talk a little bit about the browser wars. So come out, they, he comes out swinging, he goes, hey, we're going to have this HTML, which is the hypertext markup language. This is how we're going to structure our websites. I created the protocol. So Tim Berner-Lee goes, I'm going to create the first, web, the first HTTP web browser called World Wide Web. So he creates this in 1990, and very quickly, everyone sees the value. You see Mosaic come out in 1993, Opera in 1994, and then Internet Explorer in 1995. And it very quickly became a very big competition. Many people thinking there would be most likely, similar to the protocols, where there was one standard that everyone used, a lot of these browsers believe that if they put enough money behind it, they would be the one browser that everyone would use. Now, if we fast forward to today, we know that's not how it actually went out, but that's why it became very fierce as competition early on. So while you look at a couple of these web pages that he had opened in this screenshot, and it looks really exciting, but we probably wanted a little bit more style than that. So that's where we had something called CSS, where the cascading style sheets come into play. This was proposed back in the er, mid-1990s as a way to stylize websites. Now, CSS, most people don't realize this, when this was proposed, there was actually 10 or 11 different of these systems proposed. And there's different people trying to have big, they would go to conferences and go, we need to sell the web this way. No, we need to sell the web this way. And there was this big debate over how exactly to do it. But luckily for him, uh, the gentleman that proposed CSS, Microsoft was on his side. And they pushed for it to be included. And then in Internet Explorer 3, it was the first commercial browser to support CSS. One of the only times IE was ahead of the game. <laughs> so next, things started getting a little bit more complicated. We started having styles, we started having all this cool content. And Netscape goes, OK, we probably need an actual scripting language for people to do things with their website. Maybe you want to have annoying pop-ups. That's exciting. You should build something for that. So they started working on something codenamed Mocha. And they, so they go, hey, you know, there's this Java in the enterprise world. It's starting to gain traction. There's all these Java snaplets are starting to be incorporated maybe into websites. But we want a simpler version. In the actual operating system world, there's a C and then there's Visual Basic. We want a Visual Basic like for Java. So that way, someone who's a little bit more amateur, maybe doesn't, isn't going to get super in development, they could use this language instead. So they started working on Mocha, and then they changed the name briefly to LiveScript, and then when they shipped it in Netscape Navigator, they called it JavaScript. And so they were the original founders of JavaScript. Now, fast forward a couple years, they, which I think, oh, actually, in the screenshot up there, you'll see a press release of where they were trying to standardize the language, because at the time, Internet Explorer had come out with a equivalent called JScript. So they started having competing different coding languages that were similar enough, but confusing enough that people would make it in one browser and then it wouldn't work in a different browser. So again, we needed some sort of standardized process for this. And that's where the ECMA, who's actually been around since the 1960s, came in and go, was like, hey, I'll help you standardize this. And so fast forward to today, the actual name of JavaScript is ECMA script. And we just call it still JavaScript as the more commercial version of that. The actual process is still called ECMA script, and I think we're at ECMA script 5 or 2000, whatever number they're at right now. But it's still called, it's still attached to the ECMA. So, and random fun fact, Firefox, which is the descendant of Netscape, which is the descendant of Mosaic, they, their JavaScript engine is still called after, uh, is still called SpiderMonkey, which was one of the code names that Netscape used for their main first version after Mocha. All right, so. Before we get into things, I want to show you, these are all the browsers, the most popular browsers that have ever existed. So most people think there's been like five or six, or you can name maybe six or seven. Even today, there's about two dozen browsers that are actively supported. So there's lots and lots of browsers out there, a lot more than most people realize. So this is a cool chart that I found on Wikipedia, and it's definitely one that makes you realize just how fragmented some of the web could be if it wasn't for the, some of these standards that we have in place. Even today, it's still fragmented a little bit, but nowhere near as much as it could be. Now, since we have just a minute before I move on, I just want to point out something really cool. So over here, you'll see this little browser that came out around 2000 called Conqueror. So Conqueror came out, it was really popular, it was made for Unix operating systems, so Mac and Linux, and it had this really cool engine that it called WebKit. 
So it was really popular. It was how everything processed, the HTML and the JavaScript, how you know, websites were created to use this engine that they called Click. And so Apple was like, wow, that browser is gaining some traction. That's really cool. We're going to fork it and call it Safari. So they fork it, and they create this Safari about 2003. So it's a couple years later they come out with Safari. Fast forward a couple years, and we see that a couple browsers, so in the green here, this is WebKit technology, a couple browsers start picking up that going, wow, this WebKit thing is really cool. We're going to build our browsers on top of this as well. So then in 2008, Google comes in the scene and goes, hey, WebKit's awesome. We're going to make Google Chrome also WebKit based. So fast forward a few more years, Chrome is gaining in popularity, and all these other browsers going, hey, if Google's doing it, Safari's doing it, we should do it too. So now, fast forward to today, you have Edge is on WebKit, Opera is on WebKit, most of the browsers you know of, even some of the lesser known ones, Brave and Vivaldi, these are all based on WebKit, which all can be traced back to this open source browser called Conqueror. Mm -hmm. So that's a little fun fact for you. All right, so now that we have an idea of where some of these protocols came from and kind of how they, why they were thought of, I want to let's talk about what actually happens when someone types in a URL or a domain or clicks a link on your website. So our browser, we have many browsers named user, but their basic function is to handle the HTTP requests, send out the HTTP requests, and get some HTML, CSS, and JavaScript back. And then they want, their job is to display the website. So their very first step here is that someone's going to go up to the URL bar and then type in some domain name or some address, something along those lines. And it'll probably look a little bit like this. They'll start off with HTTP or HTTPS, HTTPS, and this is the actual protocol. Now, there's many different protocols. So they, theoretically, someone could do FTP. They could do SMTP. I don't know why they would, but you could do any protocol here. Technically, can be a part of this URL. For websites, we use HTTP or HTTPS, which is using a more secure version using SSLs. Now from there, you might have something called a subdomain. This is where you might have your real domain, which we'll get to in just a moment, and then you might have something in front of that. So you might have a shop.mysite.com, or you might have blog.mysite.com, or you might have staging.mysite.com. That second part of it subdomain. In most cases, you probably won't need that, especially if you're just starting out, but it is something that a lot of sites end up having two separate sites or two separate WordPress sites or even just a, a practice site or a staging site, and they use something called a subdomain for that. And then we have our actual domain. So maybe in this case, example.com or frankcorso.me or shopify.com, wordpress.org, any of these are domain names. The last part being a TLD or a top-level domain. So top-level domains could be .com, .org, .edu, .net. There's actually 1,500 of them to choose from, so there's a lot more than the original six that were proposed. But you might have seen now like .cool or uh, .it or .uk or any of those lines. There's many of them, and there's even some for specific industries. So there's like .law, there's um, .dot. Um, can't think of anything else off the top of my head. There's some for specific industries, so that'd be something to look into as well. And then to round out our random facts on domain names, there's actually currently 350 million registered domain names. That's a lot of domain names. So that's where these extra TLDs come in handy, because if you're hoping to get like, something basic like apple.com or orange.com or something like that, you're not going to get it. So that's where these TLDs slowly evolve to have more and more. So there's more opportunity for everyone to still get the name they're looking for. So after that, you'll usually have something called a path. So you might have. Example.com might be your homepage. And then someone clicks the About page, or they click to the Contact page, or something along those lines. You'll see a slash and then some, some name usually. So in this case, it's the slash about hyphen us. And that is the path, sometimes called the route, in this URL. And then lastly, you might see something like this, where there's a question mark and then some, some word or some letter like ID and then an equal sign and then some number. These are parameters. These are pairs of values with, that you can send to the server, and we'll get to the actual implementation in just a moment. So sometimes your site might have question mark ID equals 32. So that might be the post ID, or might be, you might see um, UTM underscore campaign equals some word. That might be a UTM campaign for Google Analytics. So these are different parameters part of the URL. All right, so this looks super technical. You don't actually have to know anything on the right, but there's a couple key points I want to point out. So whenever we type in that domain, so we go back to that, if someone were to type that domain into their web browser, 
which you shouldn't because that's a fake one, but if you were to try, this is what hap would happen. So on the right, I was using something called Telnet. That's super technical, I'm not going to go into it, but essentially it's a way that you can send an HTTP request from your command line. Super technical, I'm not going to get into that, but essentially this is what the browser does. So on the what the browser does is there's this little code up here as get slash http slash 1.1 host. You don't have to remember the actual process there, but that's exactly what the browser will send over. So the browser goes, hey, I need to send over an HTTP request to this server. So it goes, first it goes, okay, here's my domain name, and it checks in with the domain name system, which we'll get to in just a moment, to get an IP address. And then it sends over an HTTP request to that server. So this might be wherever your hosting is, so it could be um, Bluehost, LiquidWeb, A2 Hosting, WP Engine, Flywheel, Pantheon, wherever your hosting is, you have a server with an IP address. And so the, your, the browser will send this request, this little couple of lines here, to that server. And then the server will send back some of these lines, which we'll go over in just a moment, and then there's the actual HTML. So this is the process that the browser takes. The browser is a little bit more complicated than me just typing in a command line, but that's the process that the browser takes whenever someone types in the actual URL. Now there's a couple process parts here. There's the very first part, the GET, all capitals. This is the method of HTTP. There's a lot of them. I'm not going to confuse you by explaining what all of them do, but essentially browsers can, or anything can communicate over the HTTP network and protocol using a few different methods. So they can use something called get, and that's where they're asking for the actual website. So give me the HTML, or give me, um, if you're in maybe MailChimp, give me all my subscribers, something along those lines. Give me some information. And then maybe you're on a form, maybe you have a contact form, and someone fills it out, and they hit submit. Well, then it's going to post that data back to the server. Post being the other method here. So there's get for getting some content, and then if you fill in a form, you hit submit, most of the time that goes over post. And again, that's a little bit more technical. If you don't remember those, that's okay. We're gonna get back to how this ties back to the cycle in just a moment. But, so part of this is the method. And then from there, you'll see all these other lines here. So there's all these extra lines. Um, I'm not gonna explain all those, they're super technical, but essentially this is called the headers of the HTTP request. So there's things such as the content length, it could be the language, it could be the way, the format you prefer to come back. It could be some sort of login. So maybe if you have your WordPress site integrated with MailChimp, They'll do this request over to send your new subscriber to the MailChimp list, and there's an API key. Well, that's usually sent through the header of this request. And then there's the actual body. In this case, our, we're getting back our HTML. And then lastly, status codes. You might have seen these at some point while traveling throughout the web. You'll get some random code, like a 404 page or a 403 page. Well, there's all these different types of status codes that could be returned, and that's going to be right up here. This is the part where the server's responding. They're responding, hey, I'm coming back across HTTP, and it's 200 OK. So this is the server going, hey, this is what happened when I tried to just do whatever you're requesting me to do. In most cases, the status code is 200, and you don't even notice it. But sometimes, there will be something that is completely out there. You have no idea what this is. The, con the server's like, I don't know what you're asking for, and it responds with a 404 code. It cannot find your, any of your content. Sometimes there will be 403, um, forbidden. So maybe you're trying to do something you're not supposed to be doing. Uh, so 200 is mostly things along the lines that's OK, or things are good, or you can ignore me because I don't, I don't matter. 300 is more of some sort of redirect. You might have heard of the 301 redirect. So if you change your website, you should do a 301 redirect so you don't lose your search engine rankings. So that would be in the 300 series, things that are moving. 400 is some sort of client error. So something supposedly that the user did or the site visitor did as to click the wrong link and go to a 404 page or try to access something they shouldn't have and got the 403 code. Or there might be some random April Fool jokes like the 416, which is the IMO teapot status code. That is an official status code. So hopefully you don't ever get that one. Then there's 500, which is server side errors. So you might get, every now and then you might be doing something with the WordPress site, and you'll click on something, you'll get this weird like 500 internal server error, which means almost nothing to you, but that's all the 500 numbers are things that go wrong on the server side. So if you're doing something, you get something in the 400 numbers, and that's something that's Something about what you're sending is probably bad. But if you're getting something in the 500 numbers, that means it's something on the server side that's going wrong. So I know that's a bit technical. That's hopefully the main takeaways. There's, there's methods and status codes. That's stuff kind of So let's talk about how the domain name system actually works. So you have your domain name. 
And think of this sort of like the yellow pages. You go, hey, I want to go to Walmart, and it goes, well, here's the phone number. Well, in this case, we're going, hey, I want to go to walmart.com, and it's going to go, hey, well, here's the IP address for your browser. So in the, behind the scenes, we sort of have the browser here, and you go, hey, I want to go to walmart.com, or wordpress.org, or my own website. And this goes, okay, well, I need to get you the IP address, or I need to get the browser with the IP address. So this goes through a few different processes. So let me go one step back. Before I get to that one, the first thing we do is the browser checks in its cache. So there's this concept of caching. So anytime something comes along and there's, it requires processing or requires lookup, things can be cached, which is essentially just storing versions of it in the browser or on your website. This concept of caching is just storing copies that don't require processing power. So the browser checks its cache and goes, hey, do I know where this IP address is already at before I look it up? And that's not the case. And sometimes your router might have cache. Sometimes your ISP or your mobile carrier, your Verizons or your Cox or your CenturyLink or your Comcast, some of them have layers where the browser goes, hey, where is this? And they already know, so they tell it. But if they don't, then they have to reach out to something called the root server. And this root server goes, OK, uh, let me see. What is the top level domain that this domain's a part of? So maybe it's you are example.com, or maybe you're WordPress.org or um, helpscop.net, all those TLDs, top level domains, .com, .net, .org, these are all run by various other organizations and different companies. They're not all run by the same person. So the root server goes, oh, you're looking for a .com. Well, let me send you over to the .com name server. So we get sent over to the .com name server, and the .com name server goes, okay, well, let me check all my domain names that are registered. Oh, I see that you're looking for frankcorso.com, so let me send you over to the domain name server. And this is, you might have come across name servers when you're setting up your hosting. So if you're on like GoDaddy or um, a couple of the other ones, they have name servers a little bit more prominent than some of the other ones. You might have heard that term and go, okay, what is this name server thing? Well, this is where the domain name server comes in. So the .com name server goes, hey, Frank Corso name server, where am I sending people? And then the domain name server goes, oh, you're sending them to 56 point something, 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 something. And that's what gets sent back to the browser. And the browser goes, oh, OK, I'm going to this IP address. So I'll send that HTTP request to that IP address. So a top level analogy would be the, the yellow pages, the phone book. Another analogy might be your servers may be your home. And you want to, how do you find your home? You need an address. So you type in some sort of address. and in your GPS, and what the GPS does, it looks up the actual latitude and longitude of your house to give you directions. That's sort of what the DNS system is doing. You have some sort of address that you want to go, hey, take me to this ed address. It does a request to give you the actual latitude and longitude, and then that way you can navigate to it. Similar concept. Does that sort of make sense? Did I lose anyone with how DNS works? You feel free to ask a question. This would be a great time if you have one. Yeah? Okay. So you if and when you've ever edited your DNS, so maybe you've had to go into GoDaddy or Hover or SiteGround or any of those where you had to go in and someone tells you, hey, update your age record or something along those lines, you might have no idea what you're actually doing. So when it comes to DNS, there's this concept of records. And inside, if you ever edit your DNS, if you're on GoDaddy or Hover or any of these domain name registers, you'll see this table of records. You'll see something called an A record, you'll see something called a C name record, you'll have an epic, all these various records. Well, the most basic concept of these is that it goes, hey, you're looking for this, this is the IP address you need to go to. But you can actually have a different one set up. So you have the A record, which points to an AP IP address. So if you set up your domain name, you go, hey, I'm going to set up an A record to go, if someone goes to example.com, give them this IP address. Now you could do something called a C name record. And this is where you're going, oh, if someone's looking for example.com, well, actually send them to this other URL instead. It's a little bit more nuanced that, but send them to this other URL, and then it'll go back to this whole process to find that IP address. Or you might have something called an MX record. So if you're setting up your email hosting, they'll probably provide something called an MX record. This is for mailing purposes, for sending email. They'll say, hey, enter an MX record. So if someone tries to email you, send it to this IP address instead. Sometimes you might have something called an AAAA record. So this is where you have your IP addresses. I'm not going to get super technical, but essentially there's two different versions. Sometimes they'll give you an IP6 version, uh, and that would go underneath the AAAA record. So there's a, all these different records. Boil it down. Essentially, this, if there's something coming into the domain name server, then it's going, oh, what are you looking for? Oh, this is what you're looking for? Here it is. So that's the basics of the records. That that's how you control what you're giving out if someone's looking for something. I know that's a little confusing, but did I lose anyone there? 
quick question. Yes. Are subdomains handled in A records or C records? So it depends on exactly how you're setting up. In most cases, it'll probably be an A record because you'll have a different IP address. But it depends on, there's a lot of factors there, but most of the time it'll be an A record. OK, so we have our IP address. And we have our HTTP request. So your browser, Chrome, or Opera, or whatever the case may be, it's going to go, OK, I'm going to send this HTTP request to the server. So it gets to the server. And there's actually a few different ways servers can be set up. So whenever you signed up your, for your hosting provider, you might have had a few different options, such as shared hosting, or VPS hosting, dedicated hosting, cloud hosting, managed hosting, all these terms that you might have no idea what any of that means. And maybe it doesn't actually matter that much. But the hosting, so it sends off this request, and it gets to the server. So depending on how your server is set up, it's going to handle things in a few different ways. So before I get into that part, I want to explain briefly what the different type of hosting is, just in case. So if you're on shared hosting, the request will come in, and then all the different requests that are coming into that server, all those resources are shared across all the sites on that server. So if you're on hosting that's 99 cents a month or free or something in that range, or they go, hey, get this excellent shared hosting, essentially what it's going to do is they're going to pack all of these websites on this one server, and they're going to share the resources. So if website A is really getting crazy traffic, and they're getting, they're getting featured on Rachel Ray, and they're getting featured on all these other celebrities, and they're getting big, but they're going to hog all the resources from that server, and then your site could slow down. So that's the basics of sharing. So you're sharing resources, almost like an apartment complex. You all kind of live together in this nice apartment, but if someone's super loud, it could interfere with your lifestyle. Well, then there's VPS, or virtual private servers. So this is, while these are still sit usually on a same server, these are isolated processes. So. Sorry, it's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a terrible delay happening here. Oh, I'm sorry. So it's driving me crazy, but that's okay. okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so the virtual private servers, they work similarly in that they, they all are usually on the same server, but these are isolated processes. So you're on your own process, you're on your own site, and what you do does not affect the, your neighbor. And it doesn't affect this other neighbor. If this website A takes off and gets a lot of site traffic again, it's not going to interfere with your site's performance. So that's the difference between VPS and shared. So shared is like that apartment complex where people are super loud, they're going crazy. VPS is more of like the townhome style. So you're, there's a little bit more distance. You're still a little roomy with your neighbors, but it's not quite as packed in like an apartment complex. <laughs> Now, from there, you might have something called dedicated hosting. This is where you own your own home. Like, this is all yours. The whole server is yours. Whatever you do with it is yours. It's all everything you can do. These are also very expensive, and most people don't need them. So the dedicated server, you could have all the processing power you need, but if you have a site that's about your cat's adventures, then you, you probably don't want to spend $200 a month. Like, that's not realistic. So usually, you end up in one of these three. There's some other nuances there. We're going to get to those if I have time, but essentially most people start off with something like shared hosting, which is usually very inexpensive, maybe $5, maybe $2, whatever the deal is at the time. And then you might migrate to something more of a VPS style. So that's what a lot of the managed hostings use some sort of VPS or cloud hosting, which I'll get to in just a moment. So think of your WP engines, your page leads, your um, Pantheons, your Flywheels, your anything along those lines. Those would usually be a little bit more up the ladder versus down the ladder. But if you're just starting out, shared hosting is great. And if your site really takes off, then you want to move further up to account for other sites not slowing your site down. Now, lastly, I want to briefly talk about cloud hosting. It's a little bit more technical and complicated, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, especially since we're almost out of time. But the cloud hosting is essentially infinite amount of resources. So instead of, so you think of your shared hosting, you're sharing the server, your VPS, you're sharing the server, but a little bit more limitations, dedicated, you have your own server. Well, cloud hosting, your site sits up, sits on top of a cluster of servers. So if this server starts getting overpowered, you'll get more resources from another different server. Maybe if these two servers or this side of the room is taking a lot of resources and they're getting, they're helping all these other sites, well, then you might tap into these, some of these other servers. So it's a network or cluster of servers that are powering your website as opposed to one individual server. It's a little bit more technical, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I just want to touch that, mainly because a lot of the managed hostings are switching over to cloud hosting. So I just wanted to briefly explain it. Hosting guard goes, hey, we're switching to that. Give an idea of what that is. So we have our server. You probably have one of these. We get our HTTP request. It goes, OK, well, I have resources to spare depending on which one I'm on. And then the next step is how to actually create the HTML to send back to the browser. 
So the very first step, the server listens and goes, oh, hey, someone's making an HTTP request coming in. Let me see if there's any software that is looking for this HTTP request. Now, depending on programming languages and all these technical aspects that we're not going to get into, this might differ by a lot of different, but most of the time on a WordPress site, it's one of these two programs, Apache or Nginx. So I'm not going to get too far into these, but essentially these are just software that listens for incoming HTTP requests. And so Apache or Nginx will go, oh, you want some HTML content. OK, well, let me see exactly what you need and then process it. So what H Apache and Nginx for WordPress, the language we use is PHP. And this, so Apache will go, OK, you're looking for your home page, or you're looking for some content. Well, let me look at the PHP file that will run this. So in WordPress, there's a lot of PHP files. There's a file, a file in the main, the main file, index.php. That one will get called up by Apache, and then Apache will go, OK, hey, run this, this file, which will run all of WordPress. And then WordPress will do all of its WordPress things, figure out what page you're on, what content to load, all that things that WordPress does. And during that process, it might tap into the database. So most, and there's a lot of other databases out there. Essentially, this is where data is stored. So PHP is the file, is the code that's being run. And then the MySQL or MariaDB, that's where the actual content or settings are stored. So you're, if you install a plugin, those files would be PHP files or other files. If it has any sort of settings, that's stored in the database. If you have content, like a post or a page, that's actual content that's stored in the database. Or if you're installing a theme that has a bunch of files, that would be more PHP. So that's kind of how these two play together. WordPress will run. It'll run through the coding script of PHP, pulling some data from the database when it needs to, and then it'll send back some version of HTML back to the browser. So this process might take a while, depending on exactly what you're doing. So this is where the concept of caching comes in. So you might have had a caching plugin, or your hosting provider might offer server-side caching. So if someone makes a request to your home page, it has to load all the stuff from the database, run the PHP files, do all the configuration it needs to do, create the content, and this could take a while. So if you have server-side caching or a caching plugin, it'll do that process once, create the HTML, and then the next time someone asks for it, they'll just send the HTML again, without having to run through that whole process again. So that's where caching is a huge improvement in terms of site speed, because you don't have to go through this cycle every single time. Now, one random fact here, I just want to throw out for those developers in the room. So MySQL was originally founded by a Swedish company called MySQL AB, and when they sold that to Oracle, one of the co-founders spun off and forked it as MariaDB. So both of those are made by one of the same co-founders. But both of these, fun, this is a fun fact, is MySQL and MariaDB are both named after his daughters, Maya and Maria. So uh -huh. nice little fun fact for you. All right. Last main concept here. So the browser gets the HTML back from the server. And it goes, OK, I need to go through all this HTML and figure out how to display this. So the first thing it does is parses through the HTML and goes, OK, well, you're linking to 300 images and 18,000 JavaScript files. So I also have to go through this whole cycle, this whole HTTP request cycle, for every single one of those files that you're including. So every image you're including, every style, every plugin has usually its own styles and dynamic code. All of those will have to go through this whole cycle for every single one of those files that your site is linking to and bringing in. So it parts through the HTML, try to find those to start loading those. Then it has to start building up the HTML. So it parses all the HTML, figures out, OK, this is your header. This is probably your footer. This is your sidebar. Let me build all this out and see how this works together. And then it takes it and does this concept of painting. So this is where it starts to show up on the screen and starts applying some of the CSS and styles and those, all those lines. Now, we're almost out of time, so I'm going through this briefly, but feel free to stop me if I go too fast on it. So as it's, oh, sorry. So as it's painting, it's loading all the content. You're starting to see images pop up. You're starting to see all the words come up. You're starting to see your sidebar, things along those lines. But things might still be shifting around. Or there still might be code being run. And then, but up until the point of on load. So this is a little bit more technical term, so I don't want to spend too much time on this. But this process right here, this is so you're, the site is pretty much saying, hey, I'm done loading. Well, a lot of plugins, a lot of themes, a lot of um, like MailChimp, ConvertKit, anything that you bring in, a lot of them will wait for the on load to start running their processes. So just because something's technically loaded, it could be several more seconds before the, everything is loaded behind the scenes. And that's where you get to the concept of fully loaded. So if you do a page speed test, a couple of things that you want to watch for is first paint. That's when things start being shown. First contentful paint 
is where there's actually the useful content being showed. And then onload is where most page speed tests stop, but some will all go all the way through fully loaded. So if you're running the page speed test, you want to look for those terms so you can figure out what is wrong. So if onload happens really fast, but then fully load is taking forever, it could be a script you're including in that's waiting to onload your run. You know, that's usually like your MailChimp, your ConvertKits, your Drift, your any of those content along. Two more. Now, if if you do the speed test and then the hint is the time first byte's going, all these things before it's going really fast, and then there's a long wait in hint or onload. Well, that could be something in your HTML, but you have too many images, but you have a lot of things you're including in. Those are the things you'll be looking into is the actual HTML content as opposed to the server or scripts you're including after. So that's, that's how understanding that part will kind of help as you go through the HTTP test to try to figure out where exactly you need to look into improving. So I only have one more slide. So real quick, if you are in a browser, so you, if you want to see this, how this plays out in your actual website, if you have your browser open, most browsers have something called the developer tools. So if you're in Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Internet Explorer, and if you go somewhere in the settings, you'll find something called developer tools. The keyboard shortcut in a lot of these is um, Control Shift I or something to that effect. And there's a tab, uh, it's cut off a little bit, but it says network. So if you switch that tab and then refresh the page, all these are all the files my site is trying to load. And then I'll, so you'll watch all these come in, and you'll see how long they take to load. So some of these down here are all the way at the end, and you can see how this all plays out by running, refreshing using this tab. So it's not, it's not the most useful in the world, but it's nice to glance at it, especially if you just want to see, okay, how many files am I loading, or how long are some of these taking? You could just open this up and take a glance. Some of the PHP tests, like Pingdom, will have this similar display, so you can use that as well. All right, so we have the browser. So just to recap the things that you really want to take away from this. You have the browser. This is the thing that actually makes the HTTP request. Someone types in a URL, and then it goes, hey, uh, DNS, where am I going? And the DNS system goes, oh, OK, you're looking for example.com. Well, here's the IP address to the hosting provider, their server. So then it gets to the server, and the server goes, oh, OK, well, I'm on sure hosting, group yes hosting. Let's see, I need to find the program that's listening to this. In that case, it's usually Apache or Nginx for WordPress. And then the Apache or Nginx will run the PHP code using the database, usually MySQL or MariaDB. And then it'll process the website and send the HTML back to the browser, at which point the browser will then parse it, load in all the files, and then create the HTML for the end user. So does that cycle kind of make sense now? Did I lose anyone in this presentation? Does everyone understand that? Like, feel free to, like, this is the most important part. Yes? Well, if you go to the next link, frankslides.com has these slides are already there for your usage. Wait, just a second, is there? I just want to. I'll get back to the slide in just a moment. I just want to. Just because I'm obligated, I do just want to say I did have a whole bunch of sources for this, and there's all these images are copyright, so I have to disclose that I have all these cool copyrights here in the slides. So if you want to look them up, they're available there. So I'm going to go back to the other one. So we are already over, but is there one question that's super important that someone needs to ask? No? Okay, well then thank you so much for coming. Hopefully this was useful for you.